if I was to uh, sum up my music in two words, it would be uh, in time. I first heard of Dodge and Fusky on the site called MySpace. They were in my friend's top 12. I gotta be honest, like, before I did the tune with them, I didn't even know they were still around. I think I first heard about Dodge and Fusky when I was watching TV and a Colgate commercial came on. Bloody hell. Um, just woke up from kick-ons one day, me and the boys went to the bottle load to get some brews for the Arvo. <sighs> Fucking yeah. I think I heard it on a random Ministry of Bass compilation a while ago. It was just somewhere in there. I thought, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. It was like, it was something. And something was exactly what this unlikely duo from somewhere was hoping to achieve to finally prove to the world that there is a difference between being British and being Great British. You know, I think I've always had a real, uh, a real gift for music since a very early age. Everyone used to comment Oh, he's such a great drummer. What do you think of Robin's drum playing? Not very good. Hopeless? And uh, that was a real foundation for everything that was to come, really. What was to come was destiny in the form of a 220 pound dirt farmer from the south of England. And then I went to college and that's where I met Dodge and I uh, taught him everything I knew. I was actually on the streets of London selling umbrellas. That's where we first heard dubstep and began. We thought we could, we could do that. We both accidentally ended up on the wrong music course. Uh, we ended up at the Royal National College for the Blind. Just eight short years later, the two were ready to put their new skills to use as they climbed the ranks of UK dubstep. But it was during this time that Dodge began earning his reputation as a shrewd taskmaster capable of committing mass acts of boredom. Working with Dodge is like working with James Cameron. He wants to make a movie every single time he's in the studio. So he comes up with these weird scenarios like, we're in a battlefield in medieval England. I mean, working with Dodge is uh, not, not an easy time. Or we're on a spaceship going to Mars. Dodge has always been a little bit extra. Or we're in Mexico hanging out with a bunch of mariachi guys. What's it like working with Fusky, you mean? <laughs> it's like, if I went to the museum with my parents, I'd be bored of my ass. If I go to the museum with Dodge, it's like, oh, oh I've seen this, I've seen that, okay, in and out, and we're, we're done. And I'm just like, what the fuck, I haven't even looked at anything. The things were getting a little out of hand, um, the late nights and the alcohol. Buckets of money, legions of fans, bathtubs of approval. But an out-of-control lifestyle soon became the next chapter in the Encyclopedia Self-Destructica. Why did Fusky ever leave? Well, the good question would be, why did Fusky ever join to begin with? Well, the bloke's probably just out back having a few tinnies. Mate's got to have a smoke every now and then. Why did Fusky leave? Or wouldn't you? I guess if you've been with uh, Dodge for a while, you just, you just want some time off. I mean, he did have some pretty important farming work to do. I felt it was like becoming less and less about the music itself and more and more about, you know, marketing and and the money. Chris loves making music. I think it's really fulfilling for him. Dodge loves making money, so it's fulfilling for him too. I discovered gardening and, and the great outdoors and I just fell in love with that, really. I had a baby, he had a baby too. Um, although he had more of like an ice cream baby. I was very happy with the gardening. You know, I'd won numerous competitions, uh, you know, largest carrot. <laughs> So I got involved with this album because uh, Dodge was calling me up pretty much every night and morning and I was losing sleep before I am and I'd hear my phone ring and to the point where I just had to pick up and just tell him I'd do it. Dodge messaged him on Facebook I think a couple of times. Chris wasn't keen, he kind of deleted his Facebook. I think we even changed our phones. I don't even remember agreeing to be part of the album. I just kind of got forced into it. I said, old mate Tay gave me a ring one day. I said, g'day, he told me the good news, and I was like, bloody oath. You know what I mean? 
Do you think it's the greatest album of all time? Is that actually the name? <laughs> I, I think it's... Th what do I think of the new album? Well, it's drier than a den digger's donga, but it ain't no Johnny Farnham. How can I put this diplomatically? I think it's the greatest effort of all time, but... It's not even the greatest album of the week. I do think it's the greatest album of all time. At least it's up there with like, Abbey Road, Dark Side of the Moon, and then there's Dodge and Fusky, greatest album of all time. And I can tell you that it is because I helped write it. And Fusky and I were an unstoppable team. Oh, I guess, I guess now that Fusky is back out of his shed, there's, uh, finally there is a future. I think it's important to leave a legacy. It's been a really long path. I feel I've grown a lot spiritually and emotionally throughout it. I think it's just one of the... Martin Garrix. What the fuck is it with that guy? Jesus Christ. You know, I'm just very happy that people are still want to listen to the music we make. What's next? Um, well, I've actually been looking at getting a yacht. Um, they're, they're quite expensive. No, no. The music. What's next for the music? Music?